as I was saying, as we get ready, we got like uh, five minutes before we start the program on Facebook and YouTube again tonight. Um, and at the same time, giving some people time to come on. But again, as I said just a minute ago, if they don't come on, they can always go and listen to it later and record, watch the recording later. Um, I'm blessed and honored to be a child of God. I'm blessed and honored to be alive. Um, I just couldn't have seen where I'm at today. I'm so glad that God plan is way better than mine. I couldn't see salvation. Didn't even know what it was. Couldn't see going to church. I knew that. I was made to go to church. So, you know, I love the stories of the Bible. Um, I love the things I learned about the story that fascinated me, but had no clue whatsoever of holiness and righteousness and uh you know, if you'd have told me I had to uh, give up um, certain things in life to be saved at that time, that mentality, I'd have told you something wrong with you because I'm not letting that go. But I'm so glad that God's plan is greater than ours. I'm so glad. And so we honor him tonight. Father, once again, we thank you. For another day's journey. We thank you for your love towards us. Even when there's time we didn't feel like we deserved it. But we're so glad that love is not based on feelings when it comes to you. But love is based on what you did at the cross for us. We honor your holy name for this great and awesome day that you have allowed us to see. Another day to repent. Another day to make sure we are in right standings with you. Another day to strive for perfection. To strive to live holy. Father, throughout this day, this flesh has raised up in many ways. To a point that we may have sinned and not even understood we sin. But then there are times we know we sin. So as we come before you humble this evening. By the grace and mercy of God, we ask you to forgive us of all our sins. We ask you to forgive us of the things we have said that may have hurt somebody's feelings, may have scarred somebody in some form or fashion. Things we have done that were sinful according to your word, we ask you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. And your faith says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us. And we are in need of forgiveness every day because this sin nature that we walk in, we allow some time to put us in position to go against your word. And because this sin nature desires things of the world, we have to crucify it every day. And sometimes, God, we can have some of the ugliest attitudes, but we profess to know you. Sometimes we can look at people in ways that the old saying of looks can kill, but we profess to love you. And so since we fall short of your glory so often, we humbly, Submit ourselves to your authority tonight, God. And asking you in the name of your precious and holy son, Jesus Christ, to forgive us of our sins. And because we know your word to be true, hallelujah, we rejoice in knowing that at this very moment, by faith, not by how we feel. Because if we went by how we feel, we'll feel like we ain't doing nothing. It ain't worth praying. It ain't worth doing nothing because way we feel we beat ourselves down but by faith we're knowing that you are God that you are not flesh and bones but you are a spirit and your thoughts are beyond our imagination your ways beyond our understanding but your word says you are faithful and just to forgive me and those that are listening and those that are repenting and so we're grateful for that father we're so thankful that we can come before you with new mercies because your words say mercies are renewed daily. Amen. Mercies endure forever. But grace runs out sooner or later for some people. 
But now that we have grace and it is truly sufficient for us, mm. Mm. hallelujah. Father, even now we pray for Brother Sean Meadows and his family. Amen. For the loss of his dad today. We pray, God, that you continue to give his family strength in times like these. We continue to lift up Sister Connie Thomas as well as the loss of her son and many other bereaved families all around this world. But God, it's a blessing that just like Sister Connie came on the day after her son passed, so is Brother Sean coming on the same day his dad passed. Hey Amen. In spite of it all, God, we still have to give you glory. In spite of it all, we still have to give you praise. For you say in all things, even things that break our hearts, even things that are devastating to our thought pattern of life, even the things that come in line and hurt our feelings, you say, but yet in all things, to give you thanks. And being obedient to your word, God, it releases the Prince of Peace. That peace of, that surpasses all understanding because in giving thanks, our mind is stayed on you. And you said if we keep our mind on you, you will give us, amen, that peace that surpasses all understanding that perfect peace. And God, since you are the Lord of all comfort, even now at times like these, we ask you to go and see about these families. Comfort the broken hearts. Comfort the feeble-minded. Comfort them that are mourning and hurting right now, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody takes death differently, but yet pain is still pain. And we're asking you, Lord, to be and do and see about this family, the Meadows family, the Thomas family, and many others. And we're so grateful to you, God, for the time that you have allowed them to share with their loved ones and that they will create or already have memories of their loved ones that they can carry on and pass on the legacy of those that are passed away. But in the midst of it all, you're still good. In the midst of all, God, you are worthy to be praised. And it's in Jesus' name we pray for this family and for this ministry and for those on the sound of my voice, that they will make a conscious decision to choose ye this day because tomorrow is not promised. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So God bless you all. God bless you, YouTube. God bless you, my Facebook family, amen. Aunt Hazel, amen. Sister Ursula Benjamin, amen. Brother Sean Meadows, Sister Zanetta Polk, amen. And many others I may have missed when your name popped up. Amen. I thank you for coming on. God bless you. Amen. Uh, been heavy thinking today. Been thinking about a lot of things today. Amen. I found myself saying, I was on Glide talking earlier, and I found myself saying that I need to do better because I hold myself to a high standard. I don't hold myself to a, a basic level of standard. I will hold myself to a higher standard because I don't want to ever get comfortable in Zion again. I don't want to ever get comfortable in living a life of God that may not be pleasing to him. I don't never want to get comfortable, amen, with just going to church or just being religious or just hearing a word, amen, to say I was there. I don't want to never get comfortable because I don't want to be in the house and still lost. I know that judgment shall first begin at the house of God. And if judgment shall first begin at the house of God, and if the righteous shall scarcely make it, what about the ungodly, amen, and the sinner? Amen. Hallelujah to the word of God. Amen. And the sinner, amen, we know what that identifies. But when it identifies the ungodly, those are saints of God that's in the house and still lost, that are making conscious decisions to live an ungodly life that is contradictory to the word of God. I choose to do better. I choose to fight harder. I choose to be obedient to the spirit of Christ. And so when I tell myself I'm going to do better, I'm actually at a point I'm tired of saying I'm going to do better. And it's time to make it about action. Amen. What I say I'm going to do better to you may be simple. Oh, brother, you may be doing this right and you may be doing that right. But again, I hold myself accountable because the word of God say, let a man examine himself. So I hold myself accountable to the word of God and I demand perfection from myself because the word of God say, be ye perfect for I am perfect. That means I am striving for perfection. I settle for nothing less because I want to hear him say without equivalent of a doubt, 
well done, thy good and faithful servant. I don't want to think I may have made it. I don't want to feel I may have made it. I want to know that I know that I know. And in knowing, I need to push myself. Amen. Just like people that train to be Olympians and people that train to go to trial for football. And I know y'all notice this road tied there. Don't act like you don't know. Amen. I know you notice it. Amen. So <laughs> praise the Lord. But just like people train to get in shape and want their bodies to look good. We push ourselves for perfection in those areas. Amen. The old saying, when you work out, no pain, no gain. Amen. And life is the same way. Amen. No pain, no gain. You're going to go through some things in life because greater the call, higher the demand. Or higher the call, greater the demand. Amen. The more you go in God, the more God elevates you, the more you want to be elevated, the more trials and tribulations that's possibly coming your way. One, God perfects you through trials and tribulation. He establishes your patience. He establishes your endurance. He establishes you to be that vessel of honor that he called. And two, the devil can't stand you because what you're doing for God. So he tried to bring extra trials and tribulation, pain and agony upon your life. And he attacks you through people that you love. Because strangers don't affect you. It's those that you love that affects you. Amen. But we bless the Lord because tonight, amen, we want to talk about don't let the fire go out. Don't let the fire go out. God has given us the greatest gift in the world, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit outside of salvation. Amen. The power of the living God. He gave you, he gave me a part of himself. He gave you the Holy Spirit which is God magnified in power. Amen. And since he gave you a part of himself, when the word of God says, greater is he that's within me than he that is in the world. And since we have this fire, this power of the living God, don't let the fire go out. Amen. So we're going to get into the book tonight. Amen. We're going to go into the book of Leviticus. Amen. At the sixth chapter. And it reads in verse 12. And the fire... Upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. Amen. Wood on it every morning. That's setting aside time in today's time. We understand what he told the Leviticus priests. But in the day's time, because now the fire is no longer on the altar in the day's time, the fire is upon your altar which is the temple of the Holy Ghost, your body. Amen. So the priest was to put wood or burn wood on it every morning. Amen. We burn wood, amen, by setting aside time to spend with the Lord because our God is a consuming fire. And since he is the true fire, that he said, you walk through the waters, amen, he would not let nothing hurt us. Other words, I mean, Flip that scripture a little bit. When you walk through the fire, you never shall not shall be burned. Amen. You're not even going to smell like smoke. Amen. Because our God is a consuming fire. Amen. And since he is the consuming fire, the Holy Ghost can never be put out. Amen. But you can quench the Holy Spirit. You can vex the Holy Spirit. You can wound the Holy Spirit. For them of us or those of you that say you got the Holy Ghost. So one of the greatest questions in the Bible was asked in Acts chapter 19, verse 2. When they asked John disciples, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they, just like a lot of us, amen, thank you already got it. Because they went to saying, amen, that we was baptized under John's baptism, which is the baptism of repentance. So they were letting you know we got a pedigree. You hear me? We were baptized by John. Do you know who John is? Amen. But they didn't know about the Holy Ghost. But yet John, according to scripture, got the Holy Ghost while he was in his mother's womb. But there was only a few people in the Bible up to the day of Pentecost that the Bible said they got the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because in the Old Testament time, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. But now he dwells in us. Great is he that's in me than he that is in the world, right? So the question was asked, and the question is asked tonight. Do you or have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Now we talked about if the Holy Ghost don't come according to Acts chapter 2. 
amen, then how do you have if it contradicts the scripture? If you don't believe in Acts chapter 2 and so forth on throughout the Bible, then how can you believe you got something that is contrary to scripture? First, you must believe. Because they that believe must believe that God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus the Christ, is a rewarder of them, you and I, that diligently, faithfully seek him. Amen. When you get born again and accept Jesus into your life, he imputes his spirit into you. You become a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things now have become new. The spirit of Christ is inside of you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power of the living God, that fire that we're talking about. Amen. That's an evidence of what the word of God said. You shall be endued with power from on high. Now, I'm not going to tell anybody that they don't have the Holy Ghost because they didn't speak in tongues. Because there are some people that didn't get the gift of tongues or didn't get the evidence because that was the scripture said it's the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself said, as the scripture says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And water represents the spirit. And so some people may tell you that if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Ghost. People have a right to their own opinion. But I don't believe that so because if Jesus said, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins as if we never see him. And so if we ask for forgiveness and he says he's faithful to forgive us, right? No more sin. And he's coming back for a church without spot or blemish. So you have no more sin at that moment. How can I tell you you're not going to make it into the kingdom because you didn't speak in tongues? But if you got the Holy Ghost, sooner or later, out of your belly should flow rivers of living water, which is the evidence of the fact you got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Amen. But we put so much emphasis on tongues that we pe put people in bondage because they don't believe they got it because they don't speak it. But once you believe, because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Once you believe, then the manifestation can take place because your faith has been activated and your faith please God. I got it in the barracks in Fort Drum, New York. I wasn't in church, but I went and opened my Bible and I stood on Acts chapter two and I said, God, you see it. And if it don't happen, that means you're a liar. And you said, God, you can't lie. And so since your word is true and I believe your word to be true, I know I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. Let the rivers of living water flow out my belly and the manifestation took place. That's the word of God. So in the old Testament it said, don't let the fire go out. He said they burn wood on it every morning. You burn wood, amen, by spending time with God daily, setting aside some time to spend with the father. Amen. Getting to know him better. Getting to sup with him to understand his ways. Because his ways are not our ways, nor his thoughts, our thoughts. But the mystery of God it can only be taught through the spirit of God. Not through the understanding of man, but through the spirit of God. There are people that will look for reason to find fault in what you say. It's all right. Because it's not going to change what I know. Because what I know was taught by the Holy Spirit. It's okay that we'll disagree. But we pray for each other, not argue with each other, right? Hey, man, I had a brother on YouTube send me a scripture saying that, because I always say we shouldn't debate. I'm not going to debate. That's what I said. And I'm still not going to debate. Hey, man, he sent a scripture that says in Proverbs about we should debate. I understand what the scripture says. Brenda Cooks, God bless you. But what I'm saying is when we get to a point that we're debating and we can't come to an agreement and it causing other people that are watching to be confused and God is not the author of confusion and it causing one of us to be angry, the debate stops. Wisdom trumps the debate. Leading of the Holy Spirit trumps the debate. So I understand this individual threw a scripture at me to try to prove their point. 
But if you get in your flesh and the flesh cannot please God, then you supposed to be walking in the spirit. But we get to the point where the debate had led to a fleshly action and it led to an argument. Somebody got to stop. Somebody got to humble themselves, right? Amen. So I understand when people use scripture to make their point. Amen. But the word of God said line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, not one scripture to make your point, but line it up upon, line it up upon, line it up upon the word of God. Amen. I will not debate with people. Amen. That ain't what God told us. I will debate in the sense of reasoning together. Let us reason together. But if it's to a point that you're stubborn in your ways and I'm stubborn in my way and there's no ground being developed and all this building is animosity, God give us wisdom to shut that down until we come to a better timing, a better season. So you see, we don't let the fire go out in modern times by staying in the fellowship, by going to church, not using excuses not to go, but being accompanied together with the assembly of believers being under the anointing of the body of Christ as a whole, tearing down strongholds spiritually, walking in when you're burdened down and them yokes begin to snatch off them fetters and chains, begin to snatch away that depression and oppression, begin to snap away those thoughts that you have of whatever issue you're battling with. You can pray yourself through, but there is power in unity. Don't let the devil fool you to cost you to go against what God's word said, forsaken not the assembly of the brother. If God didn't want us in church, come on now, listen to me. If God didn't want us in church, the apostles, the founding fathers of the doctrine would not have established churches. Come on, did you hear what I'm saying? Why we let the devil trick us saying we ain't got to go to church? Young lady told me tonight, she said, I don't believe you got to go to church to be saved. I'm good. I'm a good person. But I, I told her, I ain't read what good gets you in. I said this to her, though. I said, but since your mind is already made up and you're not receptive to what I'm saying, I can show you scripture all day long. But if you're not receptive to what I'm saying, you're not going to receive it anyway. I said, because so many of us treat the word of God like a buffet. We lay it out there. We pluck out what we want and what we don't want. We leave it there. In other words, what we choose to live by, we take with us. Will we choose not because it don't fit our lifestyle. We pick the word of God and dictate what we live by. But yet in the Old Testament, that leads to the New Testament. It said, eat the whole scroll. And then Jesus said, if you love me, keep my command, obey my word. Amen. Every idle word that is spoken in here, right? Every word, not idle word that is spoken in here. So we keep the fire burning. Amen. By standing in the presence of God. You can't put the Holy Ghost out. Like in this time, they couldn't let the fire go out. But again, you can vex, you can wound, you can hurt because he's a person. of He's an entity with his feelings. He feels our compassion. He understands us. Amen. He's your friend. He's your comforter. He's your guide. You can hurt him. And frankly, he's all I got. I don't want to hurt him. He guides me and directs me. He covers me. He strengthens me. He empowers me. Why would I want to hurt the person that does all that? Why would I want to scar the one that got my back when nobody else got my back? Why would I want to do anything that would cause God to not be pleased with me? Did you not know, and I'm not saying it's biblical, but did you not know that I repented to the angels, the angels that were charged to watch over me when I choose to be a backslider and they watched all the filth and nastiness I done. It hit me one day that these angels that come from God himself that don't know sin had to watch me commit the foul act. I thought about that and I say, angels, forgive me for sinning in your presence. I ain't worship them. I just asked them to forgive me for sinning in their presence. Because in spite of it all, they had to obey God and keep watch over me. A sinner undone, a wretch that I was. Amen. So, he says, And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn their own, the fat of the peace offering. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Don't let the fire of God go out in your life. Don't vex the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't wound the Holy Spirit. Obey the Holy Spirit. 
Too many people are debating. Too many people are arguing. I said it on YouTube the other day. Why do we spend so much time finding fault in each other instead of uplifting and encouraging each other? Why do we spend so much time looking for the negativity? Because we all have sinned and fallen short. We all walk in flaws. Amen. But we're striving for perfection. Some of us walk in more flaws than others. But why is it that the saints of God are spending more time looking for sin to expose each other? See, that's the difference between covering and uncovering. Amen. Covering up sin is when someone has robbed your boss, stole money out of the register, and you as the righteous one, we call it snitching in the community. But yet your responsibility is to go to that person and say, you know you're wrong. You need to put that back. You need to go tell the boss what you did. You need to get right. We ain't trained that way. We've been taught through the community. You get you a snitch, you get stitches. No, God said to cover up something that is wrong. It makes you just as guilty as if you did it. God bless you, Faye Johnson. To cover up sin makes you as guilty. But the uncover, the covering up is one thing. The uncovering is another thing. What is the uncovering? The uncovering of Brother Johnson, amen, was sleeping around with Sister Sally. And you the only one know. It is not your responsibility to go tell everybody. That's uncovering sin. Because, see, if they realize, hey, I messed up. Oh, my God. Father, I sinned before you. And you only have our sin. And they go get it right with God. But you being messy. Amen. Being a busy body, the scripture call it. And you go and tell everybody else. Now you are uncovering sin. And that is not what God told us to do. He told us to pray, to intercede, to stand in the gap. That this person may be restored back to him. But once you put them out there for what they did, you planted seeds of discord. You planted seeds of whatever else come with that bitterness and hate. So now the people that know this, every time they see that person, they're only going to remember what you said. God bless your sister Sarah Nelson. That's all they're going to remember. So it's a difference between covering and uncovering. But our job is to pray. I always do the right thing, right? So it said in the Old Testament, never to let the fire go out. The fire go out. Amen. How? Because of our action, because of what we do. Amen. Amen. Other words, we quench the Holy Spirit. We quench the Holy Spirit. He's our convictor. He's our way maker. He's our provider. He's the one show us when we wrong. He chasing us because God chasing those he loves. Right. Amen. The fire. Amen. Uh, it shows. The fire, let's, let's, let's explain what the fire represents. I got to little sidetrack, so I apologize. John the Baptist said it this way. He said he wasn't even worthy to untie Jesus' shoelace. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. The Holy Ghost is the gift of God because Jesus said, if I don't leave, the comforter won't come. I must go that another comforter. He knew he was the comforter. And another comforter is the Holy Spirit magnified through power which is his spirit magnified through power. And when he came, we was endued with power from on high. All right? Power to walk right. Power to live right. Amen. Power to act right. Power to talk right. Power to take authority over the enemy. That's the power God gave us. That kind of power. But the power represents, or the fire, I'm sorry, represents, the presence of God among the people. We talked about in the Old Testament about the, don't let the fire go out. In the Ark of the Covenant, in the temple, the fire represented the presence of God among the people. In today's time, time frame, is the Holy Ghost is the fire that represents God's presence in the people. Come on now. That represents the Old Testament God's presence among the people. But now the fire of the Holy Ghost represent God's presence in the people. And we go back to Acts 19 and 2. Have you received the Holy Ghost? I ain't talking about you go to church and get a touch and you get a feel good and think you got something. Amen. You're still walking out, still raising hell. I ain't talking about, amen, you went and you got the chills. Oh, I just got chills all over me. Amen. That's a touch. Amen. But when you got him, you got him, you got him. 
And when he dwells rich on the inside, you know you got him. Hey, man, the evidence is the speaking in tongues. But you can have him before the evidence he manifests itself. Some people used to say you couldn't get him unless you got baptized first. But you go in the scripture, that was some got it when they were preaching the word and the Holy Ghost fell on them and, and baptized them with the Holy Ghost and fire before they even got baptized with water. Amen. So often we put people in bondage with traditional thinking. But the Holy Ghost is a free gift. Jesus died that we would have redemption. His blood was shed that we have forgiveness of sins. And the Holy Ghost came when he left and ascended up high. And he sent the power with him. So we can't let it go out. Because the only way it would go out to us, and it technically don't go out ever, is our sin. The sin that dominates our life. That's why some people are willfully, habitually sinning all the time and will still say they got the Holy Ghost. That is not so. Because the Holy Ghost would not dwell in an unclean temple. When you willfully rebel, that's that wounding, that's that vexing, that's that hurting the Holy Spirit. When you willfully rebel against the Holy Ghost, amen, he will not dwell in an unclean temple. He is so gentle and so sweet. Amen. He wants us to want him to be there. Amen. That's that greater on the inside of us. So the Holy Spirit, like the fire then, represent the presence of God among the people. The fire now, the Holy Ghost represents the presence of God inside of us. Amen. So it represents God's power, God's holiness, and God's protection over who? Us, his people. That's what the fire represents. In the book of 1 Kings, right, in chapter 18, we know the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, Ahab's prophets. How Elijah basically called a meeting. He said, we're going to do this. Let God be God, other words. And he said it this way. He said, the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Amen. That's Isaiah 18 and verse 24. I mean, not Isaiah, I'm sorry. That's 1 Kings 18 and verse 24. The God that answered by fire. John said what? The Holy Ghost shall come. Amen. And Jesus shall come. The same. God bless you, Pamela Baker. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. When you got baptized with that deuteronomy's power, Acts chapter 2. The rivers of living water flowed up out of you. It was the evidence of the power being manifested in your life. It was the evidence of the glory of God being present in your life. When you accepted Jesus as your Savior became saved, his presence was put inside of you. But the power, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that power, that power we need to go against the works of the enemy, that was a total different thing. Because our God is a consuming fire. So kindling a fire is equated with birth and resurrection. Amen. It's a force of purification. Fire purifies, right? That's what the Holy Spirit do. He cleans us up. He purges us. He get us in right standing with God. When God said, I'm coming back for a church without spot or blemish, the Holy Spirit gets you in right standings that you will be cleaned up. When God warned us and said, the little foxes spoil the vine, the little sins that we blow off and we take for granted, the little thing that we keep doing and we want to call it a little white lie, the exaggeration of a story, which is another word for lie, manipulation of an incident is another word for lying. When you're deceiving, when you're misleading people to believe something that's not true. These little foxes that adds up, amen, uh, the little talk, that leads to big talk that turns to gossip. Amen. Being negative about someone, planting seeds of discord, uncovering somebody's sin when it's not even important for the person that you tell it to. If they're not a part of the situation, they don't have a solution to the problem, but most time they don't. Then uncovering a person's sin is not what God told you to do. It's not important. Because you want everybody to know that Brother Floyd wasn't so holy that you tell Brother Floyd business when God has forgiven him. When you holding his past against him, when God don't throw it into the sea. It's not important everybody to know that so-and-so had an affair with so-and-so. 
It's not important for everybody to know that so-and-so lost their house. It's not important for everybody to know that so-and-so got caught lying and they went to jail. They was doing a DUI. That's not important for everybody to know. What's important is for everybody to pray. See, you don't quench the Holy Spirit when you pray. But you can quench him keeping up all that foolery, keeping up all that mess, keeping up all those things that God told you not to do. Don't let the fire go out by wounding the Holy Spirit, by being disobedient to the word of God, right? He uses fire to chasten us. He uses fire to keep us on our knees. Amen. That consuming fire. When God loves us so much, he is always preparing us to be in right standards. Why? We are a bride. Amen. Being prepared for the wedding. He is constantly preparing us for the rapture. For you that don't believe in the rapture. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter four talks about it catching away, being caught up, right? Amen. But of course, we got people that don't believe in it. That's okay. Like I told my brother and sisters on YouTube, I asked a simple question. If I'm wrong, pray for us because there's a lot of people going to bust hell wide open because that's what we believe. But if I'm right, I hope you don't wait too late to find out the truth. And so when people have their difference of opinion, I'm okay with what they believe. But that don't mean I got to believe what you believe. One of us wrong. But I pray that we both still make it in. I'm not going to argue about who's right or wrong. So this is what it says in 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. Verse. Um, let's start at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That you sorrow or not. Even as others which have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. It's a difference. The rapture that some of you may not believe in is not the, the coming of Christ that people talk about in the millennium period. See, that coming of Christ, everybody shall see him come down on the Mount of Olives. But in the rapture, the scripture said we shall be caught up to meet him in the sky. They're not going to see him then. That's the difference in the two. So, for this, we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. If we're not raptured, how are we going to get there? How are we going to rise and get there? They're going to rise first. Then we, would, then we which are alive and remain, still alive, not dead yet, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Amen. And understand. So let's, let's break down this commentary. I want you to hear this commentary. I want to hear this commentary. Although the word rapture does not occur in the English Bible, the Latin Bible uses the verb here from which rapture derives. The ideal is expressed in the words caught up. The rapture is the first phase of Christ's return, involving every Christian alive at that time. These Christians will be caught up to meet him in the clouds, instantaneously receiving glorified bodies. Flesh and blood, you right, cannot get there. But instantly receiving glorified bodies, all those who have died in Christ will be resurrected. Those who are alive and saved at the time of the rapture will be caught up with Christ before the start of the 70th week of Daniel. That is the great tribulation. There are many reasons to believe that the rapture precedes the tribulation. But fundamentally, this view is consistent with a historical gram grammatical interpretation of the scriptures. A close examination of the prophetic scripture reveals a distinction between the rapture, which relates to the church, and the revelation of Christ in power and glory, which relates more to Israel. Christians should find comfort in the truth of the rapture and should comfort one another with this truth. Now, you don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe the commentary. 
But it says in verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There's going to be a transformation. And the Bible said that this corruptible body shall become incorruptible. It shall transform in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. It's going to be a glorified body. I'm not going to debate it because I'm not going to get into an argument. There are some people going to believe what they choose to believe. But all I'm saying is don't let the fire go out. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't believe the scriptures, and you can say that's my interpretation, you have a right to say that. They say, I can say the same about you. That's your interpretation. But I'm not concerned about if it's yours or not. I'm concerned about what I believe. And until the Lord himself is no different than me trying to convince you I'm right. Because if your mind made up that you believe what you believe, I'm just speaking in the air. Because your mind is already made up and your brain is already locked into it. I try my best to be open to the interpretation of the Lord. I try my best to be open to the move of God's spirit. I don't always make a hundred. I don't always hit the mark. But every time I miss the mark, God have came back because I desire the truth. I desire nothing but the truth. And there have not been a time that I've been wrong. God have not came back and corrected me and showed me I was in error. So I don't get caught up in what other people think, what they think I'm right or wrong. I get caught up in the word of God. I said it before and I said it again. We put so much energy in trying to prove each other wrong. And yet people are still hungry and you ain't feeding them. People are still naked and you ain't getting them clothes. People are still thirsty and you ain't giving them nothing to drink. I would not wear a $500 suit when Mother Johnson in the church struggling. I'm not saying nothing wrong with that. You take that personal, that's something that God is dealing with you about. I'm not saying anything wrong with preachers wearing $500 suits. I ain't saying nothing wrong with preacher wearing $300 Rolexes. I'm not saying nothing wrong with nothing. All I'm saying is I won't do it. Amen. I'll keep this $10 Walmart watch that still tells time. Amen. And I will dress for success with belts, J.C. Penney, and big and tall stuff. Amen. Because if I see a need in the body of Christ, and if I see a mother that's giving her last to the church, and she wearing the same outfit every week. Then I'm sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit that I don't need no $500 suit when that mother got a need. And I'm sitting there feeding it to the image of what the world think about the church. That all we do is take their money. Again, somebody going to get in their feelings and say, I said something I didn't say. Play it over and over again. I mean what I say and I say what I mean. I'm honest. I don't need no $500 suit. I don't need no $300 alligator shoes. I don't need nothing. I don't need to look good like that. I look good anyway. Because God said I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. So I look good anyway. Spiritually, I look awesome. Spiritually, that anointing covers me with an awesome suit. Spiritually, I'm empowered from the Holy Ghost that dwells on the inside that makes me look beautiful. Amen. Makes me look, contag not contagious, but attractive. So I'm not saying anything wrong with preachers that do that. I'm saying that when there's a need, we supposed to meet the need. We supposed to be lenders and not borrowers. Amen. Not taking advantage of God's people and they are constantly giving money to us and we are never giving nothing back. Amen. God bless you, Sister Mary Flora. So before I wear, first of all, I don't even care for a suit cost that much money. If I rip it, I'm going to be mad. But before I wear a five, six hundred dollar suit and tell the church, I would never stand in front of the church and say I got a six, seven hundred dollar suit. Because that's too much like bragging. Hey Amen. I tell you, well, JC Penny suit, and they probably don't even wear them because they don't make men fit my size anyway. But I would make sure if I got to wear jeans to church, that the mothers and the homeless and people like that are taken care of. The community is taken care of when there's a need in the community that we go meet the need in the community, that we find people, God bless you, Pam Johnson, that we find people that are in need, meet needs, not wants, 
If we can meet a want, that's good. But meet need. When God says, I'll supply your needs according to my riches and glory, he used people to supply needs. If the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous, how are you going to say he don't use people? Amen. God has put us in position to be a blessing, not a taker. Amen. Not always taking and never giving nothing back. We supposed to be givers, cheerful givers at that. We supposed to be lenders, blessing God's people. Amen. Looking out for them that are less fortunate. Amen. I thank God for the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you, Sister Nikki Hall. I thank God for the power of the Holy Ghost. But that ain't me. And I don't knock no preacher that do it. Be who you are. God bless you. And I don't take back what I say because I'm speaking from my heart. I'm not criticizing nobody. I'm not even, I don't have nobody in mind when I'm talking about this. So if somebody getting their feelings, I can't control that part. Amen. We promised when we started this, this social media ministry that we will always speak the truth. The Lord told me to speak the truth. And the Bible says, speak truth with all men. Speak truth with all men. If I can bless somebody, I'm going to bless them. If I can be a help to somebody, I'm going to help them. If I got to give you my last dime, I'm going to give it to you. Not because you tempted me or trying me by saying, give me some money. No, there has to be a need. God give us wisdom how to spend being good stewards of our finances. God bless you, Charlotte Durham. And so I just won't do that. We got to talk about this in a message before. We got to stop pimping God's people. God put us to be a blessing. And we'll see somebody in need. And then we will say, bless them, Lord. You are the blesser. You are the blesser. He put you in position. You may not have a million dollars, but you still can be a blesser. And when you bless God's people, what are you going to do? Give it back to you. Press down, shake it together and run it over. Where is your faith in God? And quit looking at your situation and step out on faith. Quit worrying about the man on the street corner where he's going to go buy liquor. Quit worrying about that. If God lay on your heart to bless, you bless. You did what God told you to do. Sometimes we use that for an excuse. Say, well, uh, um, I'm not going to give because all he's going to do is go buy alcohol. You a prophet now? You a prophet that you know what he's going to do with the money? So what he smell like alcohol? That don't mean he's going to buy, go buy alcohol. He might just go buy some more food. He might find him drunk enough way. Now he real hungry. It's not about what he's going to do. It was about your obedience to what God told you to do. Be a blesser. Be a giver, a cheerful giver. Bless God's people. He told the disciples, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me the drink. But Lord, when did we see, when we see that we've been with you all this time? He said, what you did to the least of these, you did it to me. We both be the people that are blessing the community. Amen. I I International House of Prayer. Amen. And many other churches in the community uh, reached out and fed people. Amen. And I had a classmate that tell, told me at work. Uh, he said, man, I'm going to tell you something. I was at my house. Amen. And the guy that was on my roof was getting free to go to lunch. And your church came by and fed my people. Them guy, he, I looked at them and said, what about me? But it blessed me that a classmate would tell me that. But look what it did. Look what it did now. It opened the door. <laughs> don't let the fire go out. It opened the door and it gave me an opportunity to minister to him. And I'm going to show you the power of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of conviction. He came to me the next day at work. He said, man, I really enjoyed our talk. I really enjoyed the conversation. He said, Floyd, you changed a lot. I really enjoyed it. He said, man, I don't have Facebook. I don't have that, but man, I sure love to listen to you. The power of the Holy Spirit. When you don't quench the Holy Spirit, when you don't yield the Holy Spirit, y'all heard me on here the other day talking about how people hurt you, how family and friends hurt you, how people do you so bad, but they're always saying it's you, how they blame you and, and it really is them, but they don't want to see their faults because it's easy to point the finger at you and say it's you. You heard me talking about how I shared my testimony, how I was hurt, how I had people hurt me to the core, but look at the power of the Holy Ghost. Look at the power of the Holy Ghost. I said sometimes family turn against you. Sometimes friends that you had that you thought your road dog turned against you. Sometimes nobody knocks at my door. I don't have visitors. Nobody really comes see me. I'm okay with that. 
I'm going to show you the power of the Holy Ghost. The fire that we don't let burn out because it can't go out anyway. The fire that we don't allow to be quenched because we don't quench the Holy Spirit. We don't vex him. We don't want him. Guess what that fire do? We say it's a purifier, right? We say it's a chastiser. Amen. It also builds character. It builds endurance. It builds patience where you can love people that do you wrong. When you can treat people like ain't nothing ever happened. They'll look at you and don't even know that you hurt because you're loving on them like nothing ever happened. I'm talking about the power of the living God. The power of the Holy Ghost. And I come back and ask that question again. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? I ain't talking about a feel good. I ain't talking about a touch. I'm talking about knowing that you know that you know that the power of the Holy Ghost is real. Have you received the Holy Ghost or just you got a touch and thought you had something? If it ain't according to Acts chapter 2. It ain't biblical. So it's okay when people disagree with you. It's okay when people say you wrong, you're in there. I was told on YouTube that I was a false teacher. That I was preaching a erroneous doctrine by preaching the rapture. Guess what? I don't care. The devil is a lie. The word of God is true. And I don't care what no demon foul love to try to say about me. I stand on the word of God and as long as I know that I know that I know and I know who I am and I know what I have in God. I know what dwells on the inside of me because God has demonstrated his power through me. He has done it through me. And because he done it through me, I don't care what no devil got to say about me. Because I don't like him and he don't like me. That's a mutual understanding. The problem with too many saints, we're trying to be friends with the devil. And God told us to put him into subjection. Amen. We ought to put him in his place because you've been endued with power on high. Don't let your fire go out because it can't go out anyway. What I'm telling you, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't quench it. Submit to him. Surrender to him. And if you don't have him, you can get him. It's free. The price have already been paid. All you got to do is surrender according to scripture. All you got to do with Jesus said, as the scripture says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. All you got to do is repent of your sins, add Jesus into your life, let him fill you with his spirit, and then seek after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And God will give it to you. Because if you want it, he'll sure give it to you. I promise you that. It's yours for the accent. It's yours for the accent. So people going to hurt your feelings. Friends going to turn against you. Family going to turn against you. People going to treat you like you leprosy when you live holy. That's the catch. Everybody don't get treated that way, but because of the anointing in your life, if the anointing is great and you live holy, some of your closest people that you love or say they love you going to treat you so bad. They're going to hurt you. And behind closed doors, you're going to cry a lot of tears. People don't know how much I cried, but it's all right. Because the thing that my friends, hear me on this one, the thing that my friends and family thought they done, I feel like Joseph. When Joseph told his brother, this thing was of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. This thing was of the Lord. Because if I hadn't been treated the way I was treated, it wouldn't have pushed me in a spiritual cave. And when it wouldn't have made me chase after God. And if I want to chase after God, I wouldn't have the relationship I have today. So thank you for doing what you did to me. <laughs> Woo, God is good. Thank you for doing what you did to me. Because I do like Brother James said, I counted all joy when I went through diver temptation. I counted all joy when folk turned against me. I turned it all, counted all joy when they treated me like I had leprosy. I counted all joy when nobody come knock on my door. I counted all joy, but guess who's knocking at the door? If you knock, I answer. I will come sup in with you. Guess who's always knocking at my door? They call him Jesus. I call him Yeshua Hamashiach, the anointed one. That's who is always knocking at my door. Always. I will not shed another tear because how people treat me. But I shed a tear for their souls. Hey Amen. I'm not concerned <laughs> what you believe about me or not. I'm concerned about your soul. I want to see your soul right. I want to see you filled with the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, you will not hear the trumpet sound. And if you don't believe in the rapture anyway, you ain't going to hear it anyway. Come on, somebody. Woo! I'm going to be caught up. 
You can stay here and keep saying it ain't him. But I'm going to be caught up because of the power of resurrection power. The power of the blood. The power of the fire that's going to catch me up. Hallelujah. I'm going to be caught up. You stay here. You go through the seven year tribulation. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> the scriptures say he's going to save us from the wrath to come. Do you know the wrath the Bible talks about in Daniel and Ezekiel? That wrath is the tribulation period. And the word said he's going to save us from the wrath to come. You keep staying here. I'm getting out of here. I'm catching the first train smoking. Amen. Because I'm not going through this. And I hope to catch up with y'all there. And if you ain't there, as my bishop always say, if you died in your sins and went to hell, tell hell Florida ain't coming. Because I ain't coming. <laughs> I ain't coming. So judge me. Condemn me. Do all what the natural thing you can do because you can't do it to me. Because I'm endued with power. I have the Holy Ghost. And like I said the other night, if God would take a joker like me and allow me to lay hands on people that have blood clots, amen, and then they can't find the blood clot, and allow me to lay hands on a man with cancer with six months to live, and they can't find cancer, and allow us to pray for the sick and afflicted and see them raised up off their bed of affliction. I ain't going to tell you it happens all the time. There's a season for everything. God has a purpose for everybody destined in their life. But I don't see the glory of God shine. I don't see the power of God move. I know what dwells on the inside of me. I know what comes up out my belly. And if you don't believe in that, it don't matter because the Holy Ghost is real. Because Jude 20 say, build up your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. That was a specific language that the Holy Spirit speaks on your behalf with moanings and groanings and intercession that you don't even know what you need. Amen. Because when you pray with understanding, sometimes we pray pray selfishly. But when you allow the spirit of the living God to pray for you, it make intercessions for you. It tears down strongholds. Don't let the fire go out. Stay in the presence of God. Don't let the fire die. Stay prayed up. Stay fasted up. Stay chasing after God. And you'll find out he's real. You that don't believe will find out too. I hate for something to happen to you find out. But God is real. I'm an old country boy. That grew up Baptist and Methodist. And got saved in Koji. But now apostolic. You know apostolic folks say apostolic. But I ain't really know why they said apple. <laughs> but the power of the Holy Ghost is not based on denominations. It's based on faith in the word of God. It's based on believing the scriptures. And standing firm. So you. I'm going to close with this here. You that say the rapture is not real. Hear me good. You that say I'm a false teacher. And I'm teaching false doctrine. You that say this. This is a question I have for you. Not only have you received the Holy Ghost since you say you believed. But can you walk and demonstrate the power of the Holy Ghost while you're worried about what I'm doing? Can you lay hand on the sick and watch them recover? Can you cast out demons in the name of Jesus? Can you speak in new tongues as the scripture says in the name of Jesus? Can you demonstrate the power of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of the hands? Can you speak into the atmosphere and see God create an atmosphere that's unchangeable? Can you speak to the situation in your life and see those mountains be removed? Can you stand on the word of God or all you're going to do is sit back and criticize who I am? Which you're criticizing God. Because if you can't step out with power, you can't demonstrate with authority, then you the one living a false life. Because greater things ye shall do if you believe. That's what Jesus himself said. Greater things ye shall do if you believe. And then he said it this way for you non-believers. He said, these signs shall follow them, all of y'all that believe. In my name, they shall lay hand on the sick. The Bible says, if any afflicted, let them pray. If any sick, let them call on the elders of the church. They may anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith that they may be healed. These signs. What sign? God's miracles and wonders. His signs shall follow them that believe. They shall cast out devils. A Beelzebub, if I'm a devil, 
The Bible said Beelzebub cannot cast out of Beelzebub. They shall cast out devils in my name. They shall speak in new tongues. God is so worthy. You keep believing what you choose to believe. I believe in the power of the fire that will never go out. <laughs> it ain't going to never go out because it's going to catch me up and I'm going to be caught up, raptured up, and gone up while you're still sitting here trying to figure it out. <laughs> Woo! God is good. God is good. Amen. You can't shake my faith. You can come against me all you want. You can't shake my faith. No, you can't. I know too much about him because you can't make me doubt him. Hey, man, this thing is real. I ain't know nothing about this when I was growing up. I ain't know nothing about the power of the Holy Ghost. I ain't know nothing about the miracles of God. I got it. I got it. I got it. I'm holding on to it. <laughs> you hold on to what you hold on to. But I'm holding on to it. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hey, man, so in closing, if you don't know Jesus tonight as your personal Savior, I said this on my glide app before I came on. And I'll say this in closing. If the Bible says, let a man examine himself. So right now, I want you to take a moment out to examine yourself. Ask yourself this question. If you die tonight, would you make it in? You got to be honest with yourself. What unforgiveness, what bitterness. See, these people that were criticizing me, dude, they should have been on there talking about. Not about what I'm right or wrong, preaching a false doctrine. But what bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, frustration that you're allowing to stop you from making it into the kingdom. The Bible asks the question, who shall separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Shall distress and name a lot of things, right? So the word would have summed up the saying, what you let get to you? Who you let bother you so much that you can't let it go? One of the sisters in our church spoke a message on our glide out. She said, you can't unknow what you know. I'm going to preach on that one day if the Lord let me. You can't unknow it, but you can show forget it. What I mean by forgetting it, you can forgive it and let it die in the sea. You're still going to remember it. But see, when you let it go, when you see that person, it don't change your demeanor. When it's, you see that person, it don't change your attitude. When you see that person, you don't go the other way. Come on, let's self-evaluate right now. When you see that person, you don't act like you don't see them. You, do, you don't not speak to them. When an individual can walk in the room and you can be smiling, rejoicing, and having a good time, and you change your whole demeanor, your attitude change, there's something there. There's some unforgiveness. There's some bitterness. There's some something that you are allowing to put you in bondage. That will cost you to have little foxes that spoil the vine. And possibly if you don't let it go, it'll lead to unforgiveness. You won't forget it. But see, forgiveness don't never bring it back up. When you really forgive somebody, you don't bring it up every time you see them. Every time, remember you did me like this? Remember you did? That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness don't forget, but it don't always remind somebody what they might have asked God to forgive them for. And when you say you forgave them, it's buried. Why are you still bringing it up? So what is it that's in your life that may cause you to miss God if you die tonight? You can get it right, right where you at. You can repent right where you at. You can make a confession as God into your life right where you at. But we're going to tell the devil that he can get permission to fool you. For Satan not to send him to find you a home church. Find you a home church so you can grow. Find you a home church so you have a covering, someone covering you in prayer. Find you a home church. Let God be God in your life. Let him be real, man. Follow the scriptures. Don't worry about them naysayers. My mom always said there's going to be some haters. Don't worry about them. And people are always going to come at you. You're going to have people, no matter how many times you preach, somebody's going to always have something to say. And yeah, we should be winning souls instead of worrying about who's right and who's wrong. I don't get caught up in what denomination are right. I pray for them. But we should be encouraging each other to get right by prayer and encouraging them by speaking love to each other. So God bless you all. If you ain't got it right tonight, you need to get it right where you can. Let God be God in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray now that everyone that heard this word, that it will saturate their heart with truth. 
And we know the word shall go out and not return void. And Father, we're praying that the power of the Holy Ghost rest on them heavily. And that for those that have not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that you endure them with power from on high. For you said in the last days, said the Lord, I pour my spirit out on all flesh. Keep pouring your Holy Ghost out, God. Keep pouring your spirit out on us because we need your power. We need your love. We need your forgiveness. And we find ourselves, God, anything in our lives that we have not let go of. God, give us the strength to lay it at your feet. Give us the strength to cast out cares upon you for you care for us. Give us the strength to walk in obedience, God, and not as a rebellion, rebellious ways. We thank you for this opportunity. We love you for the ministry that you have given us. We love you for those that support the ministry. We speak blessings upon your people tonight. We speak favor upon your people tonight. That whatever need they have, whatever situation they're going through, God, that you say it, you'll be a very present help in the time of trouble. And we ask you, God, to be there for them tonight, God. Let them know that trouble don't last always. But if they learn to wait on the Lord, be of good courage. And again, I say wait on the Lord. They learn to wait on the Lord that you will give them strength to endure. And we thank you for this opportunity to glorify your name. We thank you for the love you have for us, God. And we appreciate you so much. We thank you that it's not by might nor by power, but it's by your spirit that speaks to your people. That we are only oracles of God, mouthpieces of God. And we thank you, God, that we can love on your people in spite of the hate that we get from them. We can disagree to disagree, but we can be bold in Jesus Christ, bold in the word of God and not put up for anything that is not of you. We thank you, God, that you didn't tell us to be, make friends. You told us to show ourselves friendly. And we pray that we make good friends, but everybody that say our friends are not our friends. Everybody say they love us, don't love us. But God, we thank you that you do. <laughs> you, your love is a, unconditional. I'll take your love any day, Lord. And God, I learned that those that are going to be my friends going to be my friend. Those that are not, I'm okay with loving them from a distance, but loving them with a pure heart. Amen. What I mean by a distance, when I see them, I love on them. But God, you told me to protect my anointing. So even around friends, sometimes we have to protect our anointing. Even around family, sometimes we have to protect our anointing. I love you, Lord. I appreciate you so much. I can't do nothing without you. So I'm asking you to have your way, God. Let someone repent tonight. Let someone get it right with you tonight while they still have breath in their bodies. Let someone get a relationship with you, God. Let someone be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And we love you and we appreciate you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, if you don't have a home church, find your church. If you have a church, man, be faithful to the ministry that you're in. Support your leaders. Amen. Obey them that rule and authority over you that it may be well in your life. But if you don't have a church and you're in Mississippi anywhere, feel free to come fellowship with us at 3713 Main Street, Moss Point, Mississippi, under the leadership of Bishop Kelvin D. Bolden. I am not promoting a church. I'm promoting the body of Christ. But I'm just saying until you find a home church, come fellowship, come hang out with us. Come worship the Lord with us. Amen. We have Bible study at 6 o'clock prayer on Wednesday night, 6.30 Word Alive Bible study. On Sunday, we have 8.30 prayer. With 9 o'clock Sunday school, we feed the children in the back, the word of God and breakfast. And we have 1030 service on Sunday. Come out and support the ministry. If you don't want to support our ministry, support the ministry that teaches the gospel truth. Amen. God love you. I appreciate you. And continue to keep me in prayer. If you're righteous. <laughs> in Jesus name. Amen.